scary. <laughs> Live video starting. Uh, we are now live. Let's see. Hi, Rachel. Hopefully, we are live. Um, we've had a couple of um issues going live. Um, hopefully, you can see us on um Facebook. If not, we will have to um <laughs> put up this this. Um, oh, no, I can see it. It's there. It's there. Brilliant. <laughs> so, okay. We've had technical issues once again, people. Please um, bear with us. So, thank you for anybody who is joining us. Um, it's great to see you here. And um, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I will... Um, or in the comments, and I will keep an eye out and see if there is um, issues going. Okay, people, please um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I will make sure that um, everything is um, conveyed to Rachel as we go along. So, oh, after all of that. Welcome, Rachel. Um, thank you so much for coming on and um, being with with me on this beautiful afternoon. Actually, on the Kapiti Coast, so um, it, it's an it's an extra big thank you because you could be outside having having a bit of um, R and R in the garden. Um, just to introduce Rachel, Rachel Bowell is. A Davis facilitator, a highly experienced educator within the um, the adult education realm, um, particularly with adults who are who were or are most at risk. Um, having worked in the prison system, that's right, Rachel, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and um, also with a lot of um, at risk, at risk youth at the moment because mm. she is um, working with a lot of our neurodivergent, divergent children, particularly here on the Kapiti Coast. So today, really, Rachel, it's going to be mostly over to you. Um, for the people who are watching this live, we are going to be talking about um, Davis techniques and how they influence or how they can um, make a neurodivergent person's life a whole lot easier. And I can say that with my hand on my heart, because I am dyslexic and if I had not done the Davis course as an adult, I probably would never have done my master's and um, or attempted my master's because of my, obviously I can read and write, but um, the disorientation around reading for me is particularly debilitating and it takes me ages to read anything when I am disorientated. And I never realized that that's what was happening until I did my Davis course as as a client mm. um, and as a teacher actually and um, the results were nothing short of miraculous and I have seen the same results over and over again with students that I have worked with using the Davis strategies um, and I cannot advocate more strongly for um, this this modality for for students who are struggling, and not only students, adults as well. Rachel, how old is the oldest person you've you've worked with? Well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you for such a, a warm welcome and. Um, really big recognition to you too because you've been working with students um 
really at the cutting edge of uh, dealing with the, I guess, the downstream effects of neurodiversities that perhaps have not been firstly identified or mm -hmm. addressed during their their journey through this through school and into adulthood. And so, um, to have someone like you with with the level of expertise and experience that you've had, really working with a lot of at risk learners. Um, mm -hmm to then speak uh, so warmly about the Davis Method and how it makes such a difference, and obviously from your personal journey, but what you've observed with young people who have been exposed to the Davis Methods, either in the classroom or perhaps, um, you know, being through a facilitated program. So um, I think the, the thing for me, what motivated me to become a Davis facilitator was that I was working with um, both adults and youth at risk in the um, in the prison service here in the correction service uh, in the education and training field and particularly around vocational training. Uh, but then I moved on to work in the Wananga space as well, and and the same patterns would show up. So really bright and capable people of all ages mm -hmm. and who worked hard uh, for their learning, but at the same time you know, you'd teach something on a Friday and come back on Monday and it would seem like it hadn't stuck. But, um, yeah. Or they were still struggling or it would take them a long time to do something that you would think with someone with their capabilities would do more easily. And mm -hmm. so that sort of set me off on a, a journey of exploration and I went and did a postgraduate diploma in adult literacy and numeracy and made a point of studying a bit about dyslexia and also the maths version, dyscalculia, to really get my head around what was happening, what was I seeing, and really I was interested in what was the root cause. And it took me on different paths, and eventually I came kind of almost full circle back to Davis. I'd come brushed up against Davis uh, 20 years earlier when a partner of mine identified that he had dyslexia in the first book, that I saw in the bookshop happened to be Ron Davis's amazing book called The Gift of Dyslexia. Yeah. And I only, you know, we shouldn't live with regrets, but my only regret really is that I didn't really get it back then and take it on as what to do with my career. I was doing something completely yeah. different back then. But actually, um, um, Rachel, I actually read the book in 1994 when it first came out. Mm. And it was a complete revelation to me. It was like, oh my giddy art. This this is me, you know, talking about me in the most um, explicit ways, you know? yes. <laughs> um, you, we, we'll get we'll get to this later on, but mm. um, you know when when Ron says in his book that um, dyslexic think thinkers think in pictures, I was like, what the heck? Is there any other way to think? <laughs> Yes. Does anybody think? Because you don't, you don't realize until you don't know what you don't know. So no. yeah, it is a brilliant book. It really is a brilliant book. It's a it's a brilliant book, and really everything about the Davis method is encapsulated in that book. And Ron wrote it to support and empower parents, in particular, to work with their children if they were in. A, place where they couldn't get to a facilitator, a trained facilitator. And yeah. um, I do know parents who have taken the book and gone page by page and worked with their, their young people and produced amazing results. So yeah. it is out there um, in the public domain. And I re recommend whether you're uh, working with someone who is a facilitator or your child's in school with um, the tools being taught by your teacher um, or their teacher, that book is a great companion to understand mm. the principles of the Davis method. What is the underlying root cause of these dyslexic um, challenges that people have? Mm. Um, and which perhaps if we talk about that now, and then what are the remedies? You know, his book was written not just to highlight the challenge, um, but to really talk about what are the remedies and how can uh, people with a dyslexic brain use their natural talents, which is often the picture thinking and the kinesthetic propensities to master mm -hmm. those dyslexic disorientations, which you spoke about before. And so 
perhaps if I give an example of a disorientation, we often have an experience sometimes when we're stationary and other things around us are moving that we become uncertain about who's moving. So, for example, if I'm at the supermarket and I'm reversing out of the car park and someone drives in beside me, I'm like, is it me moving or is it them moving? And so I stop. I put on the anchors and I wait until everybody else has done their manoeuvres and then I move because I'm uncertain in that moment. That moment of uncertainty is a disorientation. And we've probably had a lot of other examples like it when you're at the lights and the same sort of thing happens. Yeah. So and it's as a, a visceral, it's a visceral thing. Totally. I'm just like, I'm not moving until they're done. Yeah, exactly. It's that gut thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, a, yeah. And everybody has them. Like yeah. whether you're dyslexic or not, we all have disorientation. It's a natural human thing. It's when our one of our perceptions is out. And so our brain is trying to compensate, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you go to, when you're a reader and you have a dyslexic brain and you think in these pictures or 3D images and you're trying to read a 2D flat surface text, your brain is struggling and it, and it tries to resolve the problem by looking at it from different angles. And so that's when you start to get confusion. So confusions mm -hmm. with letters, confusions with that's words. Yeah. And, and that's the yeah. disorientation. And children have said to me, I feel ill. I want to throw up. I, they want to go to sleep. So their body is, is trying to find, come back to that state of equilibrium by yeah. throwing one of the other senses out to try and resolve the, yeah. what's gone, gone awry there, if you like. And so that's a disorientation happening. And it can be momentary and people get, little words mixed up and we'll talk about those little words and a little bit down the track but yeah. or they can just get the letters back to front so they'll say b instead of d or p yeah. instead of q or they get the m's and the n so sometimes it's a disorientation on sound mm -hmm. sometimes it's a disorientation with the shape of the letter mm -hmm. it can be around actual words and the meanings and their understanding of those words and so all of those add up to mistakes and trip-ups when you're reading, and particularly aloud. I mean, the most stressful thing, I reckon, for any human being is to be asked to read aloud. And we do that to our four- and five-year-olds all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it should be banned in some way, so it should be banned. I know it helps us as a teacher, as an educator, to hear are they reading and understanding, but actually yeah. it's very, very stressful for any person. And then if you have on top of, that normal stress, it's you've got issues with, with that. Um, it's, you know, I, I used to freeze in school. Yeah. Um, you know, I know people who spent all of their maths classes in the toilet to avoid, <laughs> you know, the stress of their maths class. Um, yeah. There's lots and lots when you start in this working in this field and talking to people, people have these really amazing strategies to avoid the stress and the pressure and the potential failure of re reading out loud or writing on the on the board or mm -hmm. turning in written work which is then going to be judged and assessed and what we get what we tend to judge and assess people's education on um, in the conventional senses is it spelled right is does it is it neat you know mm -hmm. have we got capital letters and full stops like all of that sort of technical stuff, which is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but as an individual, turning that over to be judged and assessed is really stressful. And if you're dyslexic and you know what you've produced probably is going to be judged, you're going to avoid it. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and avoidance behaviour can actually show up as, as bad behaviour. Yes. At the time, which is... Um, actually, a stress response yeah. rather than a, a, a just a bloody mindedness. So totally, yeah. and that's that's as I've been doing more of this work because you know I came from working in prisons where you saw the end result mm -hmm. of avoidance behaviours, you know, defiant behaviours, and so forth. And I I'm now interested in what is the the causal pathway that you end up with an eighteen year old 
with an attitude in prison yes. who fundamentally is a good person, but they ended up doing things through life that got them a bad reputation, and then they actually end up doing something that was illegal or harmful to another, so then the state says, we have to put you away. We have to put you away. And yeah. I, think, I think the the, um, the latest data around prisoners is that something, something absolutely astronomical, like 85 or 90% of prisoners are neurodivergent in some yes. degree, to some degree. Yep. Um, whether it be ADHD, whether it be dyslexic or dyspraxia or whatever it is, mm. um, the majority, the big majority, yes. have had issues, learning totally. issues or challenges yeah. because yeah. of their, their, the way they think. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that is, I really commend... Uh, the person who advocated and stood that work up in prisons, Mike Stiles, who's a mm -hmm. good colleague of mine, because he's been such an advocate for so many years that we need to address this issue in prisons. And mm -hmm. he finally got, you know, a, a decent sized survey done. And mm -hmm. I commend corrections for taking it on because at least you now in identifying these issues, we have an opportunity now to address them, yes. both with the people who are incarcerated, but also potentially with members of their families and with the earlier generations coming through. Prevention. Because, prevention. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all about prevention. And so when yeah. I have a young, I uh, have to say often as a lad, when I have a young lad that I'm working with and I see those uh, behaviours of avoidance and defiance and so forth, I'm reminded of older versions of them, you know, 10 years down the track, mm -hmm. and it has me stay really true to my purpose of helping that young person learn what is it that's triggering that behavior and how to minimize those triggers and how to respond in a an effective way so that they don't escalate that energy okay. right it's the escalation that is the issue being mm -hmm. angry we're all angry at times we all get frustrated it's a natural part of life but it's when it escalates into behavior that people can see or people um, or it harms others right mm. so I had a, a wonderful kid that I worked with last year and he recently was acknowledged for his capacity to not get cross during his sports activities he's a great he's a great sports person mm. and his coach at the end of the year said oh well done for not getting angry and taking that anger out on others in the team and that was a real upset for him mm -hmm. and his behaviors mm -hmm. and that will stand him in good stead yes. going forward in life that he knows now I don't have to take it to a level of a fight mm -hmm. I can step mm -hmm. back I can use some of the tools that I've learned in my life to regulate or self-regulate that impulse that's kind of right under the surface there to you know go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone yes, and absolutely it, yeah. And it's about connection, isn't it, Rachel? That's what I love about Davis. Um, because for me, um, education is about three things. It's about connection, first of all, communication and creativity. Those are the only mm. three things that, for me, education is about. Um, yes. If we can establish all those three in every single one of our children, neurodivergent or not, we would be able to change the world in the generation. Yes. I'm pretty damn sure about that. Yeah. And the the great thing about Davis is that it works at a, at that level. It works at the level of creating a a space that somebody can connect, that somebody yes. feels safe enough to connect, that somebody can communicate. Because that that's the biggest issue, really, is the communication. Yes. And and then thirdly, that somebody can use that natural creativity in a really constructive way. Um, which, you know, as other look, I'm not, I'm certainly not putting down other other ways of being or teaching or pedagogy or anything like that. We need we need them all. Um. 
But Davis is like the key that goes into the lock that unlocks the humanity. Yes. The, the, the potential. And not only neurodivergent children, in, in, in all children. It's it's a, it's a it's a fabulous tool. Yeah. Well, there's there's some good research that was done here in New Zealand. Um mm -hmm. so Davis has got a range of different um what's the right word? Delivery That's styles. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and delivery styles. And one of them is called Davis Learning Strategies, which is designed for uh, teachers, tutors, um, teacher aides at that primary level one to four, mm -hmm. year one to four, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been implemented through a number of schools in New Zealand over the last 10 or so years. And there was an amazing piece of research done by a principal uh, Jane Severinsen from Waiofo Downs School down in um, North Otago. Yeah. And she went around the country. She took six months sabbatical, went around the country and did this piece of action research as follow-up from the implementation of these Davis learning strategies. And these are the core tools which are outlined in Ron's book and also the beginning work of any one-on-one -on -one facilitation. And they're about helping young people learn to de-escalate that, that aggravation energy or that high energy that gets in the way sometimes <clears throat> of learning. Mm -hmm. um, being able to uh, uh, be relaxed but alert when they're learning and also to be able to be focused when they're learning. So those are kind of the, some of the key tools that get taught as well as mastering the alphabets, the upper and lowercase alphabets, which is what you're already looking at, at in those years, but doing it in a 3D way so that every learner, whether they're dyslexic or not, has a clear picture and feeling for the each letter of the alphabet, which makes mm -hmm. up it's the raw ingredients of words. So Jane did this great big survey and the results came back were just off the charts. So all the schools saw first the thing that changed and they surveyed all students, not just the dyslexic ones. What the first thing we saw is an increase in attendance. So more students started coming to school after the teachers started using these methods in class. Then the next thing they saw is fewer students were getting excluded or expelled. Interesting, mm -hmm. right? So the behaviors mm -hmm. changed first. And then the reading results went through the roof of all students. So whether they were dyslexic or not, the reading results were off the charts. And the dyslexic students started to catch up with their, their peers. Amazing. And this was across a range of different schools. So, you know, from decile one to decile 10, mm -hmm. all these different schools were involved in the survey. And it's kind of the best kept secret in the dyslexia world is this piece of research in New Zealand. And I really would love to see more of those methods made available to every teacher it is designed for those new entrant students, but it yeah. has application to with older students as well. Absolutely. But every and then you can layer in all the other reading methods. But if you have a foundation as a human being that you can visually and kinesthetically, so with the use yeah. of um, you know tools and so so forth, as well as orally, understand your alphabets which are your raw ingredients of words, and then understand words from that perspective and then learn in a calm and happy and productive way, you are up to, you've got a great foundation for the rest of your learning. Absolutely. It's not either or, is it, Rachel? No, uh, no, it's, it's, not at all. It's just, um, there is a very strange perception out there that if, um, if you're doing, if you're doing Davis, if you're using Davis strategies, that you can't do structured literacy, or that that the one cancels the other out, or um, th these are all fallacies that have been I don't know why they've been propagated, um, probably fiscally um, connected, but um, that it, it is not true at all, you know. And um, if you've got if you've got a variety of 
programs or a variety of strategies happening within your program, mm. you've got a better chance of catering to more students' needs. Yes. And um, so, yeah, I think... Well, yeah, we, we, we you find... To that? Yeah, well, we find that because my background is in adult education. It's only now working with Davis that I um, am working with younger students. But all my career in adult education, you know, there were all these models to point us to the fact that we can't just have one mode of delivery. There's the VARC model, right? Are you a visual, auditory, kinesthetic learner? And, you know, we were doing that back, you know, back in the day when I was in adult education. So you would have different modes of learning. And yeah. I think the same applies for our young, young people, that they need a variety of different learning methods and why they'll find the one that works best yeah. for them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Why would, why would it be different? <laughs> yeah, it isn't. We don't suddenly change and, and need a variety of learning methods when we turn 18. Yeah. We need it from zero Yes. And if you look at how I, I have two young grandsons now, and yes. if you look at how they interpret the world and learn from the world, it's varied. You know, yes. I've got one and he's busy climbing over everything, you know, yes. and getting into things yes. and yes. moving yes. things from one piece to another part of the house and yes. and he's um and so and he's very tactile and he spent very much his very early months his parents are farmers, lying on the grass, face down, exploring yeah. that world. <laughs> yeah. And he's putting, he's uh, not been a fast adopter of verbal language. He still mm. communicates, but, you know, he's still developing, you know, his word yeah. language, whereas his, um, sub, you know, his, uh, the, my other grandson, um, yeah. you know, he's, he's in a different stage, but he is exploring the world in a different way. You know, mm -hmm. and so we want to be able to provide that variety um, mm -hmm. through the way that we're working with young people in schools so that they learn the way that best suits them. And we know we've got 20%, all the research shows 20% of the world is probably neurodivergent in one way or the other, you know, I'm and we have different needs. Yeah. I, and it's I'm increasing. Sure. Yeah. And, 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 Potentially, there's a lot more of us, but we just haven't been identified yet. I mean, I didn't realize till I was 50 that I was neurodivergent. Yeah. You know, and I would have thought I was more of a word thinker, but I definitely have ADHD. And I also have um, a little known uh, neurodiversity called dyspraxia, which is the clumsy version of, of dyslexia. And so I was the yeah. five foot 10, uh, ready built for netball, unable to catch a ball kid in school at 12. How frustrating and, um, for your coach. <laughs> very frustrating for me, very frustrating for my coaches. It's like, can't you see it? Probably not. But I, I just couldn't clock the speed and the angle and the spin on any ball, large, right down to a hard and very painful cricket ball. Nothing mm -hmm. Uh, it aided my capacity to catch. Well, like I, I, I told you the other day, I was asked to leave the beginner's tennis um, class after yes. three years. They said to me, you don't think tennis is for you, dear. Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't matter. It, it didn't matter what ball sport. It, it wasn't for me either. So no. actually, um, I, my sport of choice was swimming. Yes. which I excelled at, and and horse riding, which I excelled at too. Um, well, I, I have a theory both, about both. swimming. Yeah, I have a theory about swimming is that you do a lot of right-left brain integration, particularly oh, if you do the yeah, you do Australian swim. crawl. And um, I did a lot of that. <laughs> I went, Swimming was my solace as well. And it's great. I'm glad I learned to swim as well as I can and and – at that age however what i missed was the camaraderie of team sports oh, team sports exactly yep. that's what i'm about to say and and actually team developing team. any coordination skills beyond being able to swim and so you know when i have a young person come to me now and they have dyspraxia or some issue with balance and coordination i'm very excited to work with them because i want them back on the court playing sports or on the field 
participating yeah. in life, being able to ride a bike, a skateboard, whatever their thing. My my very first client with dyspraxia um, used to run along and then fall down in a pile of giggles. And that was his coping mechanism. He made a joke about his complete uncoordination. Oh. Oh, but it was and it was funny, but it was also sad, and that's one of the reasons his um grandmother brought him mm -hmm. to me. And then um, you know, he a year later, I said, "What are you up to these days?" He said, "Oh, I do BMX biking." And I said, "How do you?" Because that scares the heck out of me. The thought of doing yeah, BMX right? biking. And I said, "How do you do it?" Because he does all these amazing jumps and flips and yeah. Said, well, I just stand at the top of the ramp and I visualize my whole thing and I use my Davis tools to make sure that I'm really focused and then I go for it. Oh wow! Well, and he has a, a whole peer group now of really um, who love what he does and and look up to him. Whereas before yeah. he was the class clown. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it could have been really annoying for the teacher, I'm sure. Totally. Yeah. Well, he and for his peers, because he would just muck up school games all the time by his, you know, it's loose arms, there. loose legs, you know, yeah. not able to finish something. Yeah. yeah. So I, as much as I'm all about, you know, people excelling with their academic skills as well, and that's really important, mm -hmm. it's the social interaction and the participation in activities in school that for me are, are kind of like my, my social um contribution really to these young people's lives that, young people and just the confidence you know I, I we could yeah. talk for hours about my lack of um coordination around you know eating going to dinner with people <laughs> coffee well, coffee spills. My, children, my children just shake their heads they just go oh excuse mom she's always got food all over the place so. yeah. <laughs> and we can laugh about it now yeah. but when I had no answer to it. Like, yeah. why was I the person who always dropped, you know, the platter of food at a buffet? Do you know? Yeah. It was so embarrassing as an adult. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I was not safe with drinks, you know, long-stemmed wine glasses, super, super dangerous. Um, and it yeah. is, it's, now it's funny because it's like, okay, I know what was going on, but I had no idea and I couldn't explain it. And people go... Mm -hmm. Have you had one too many or, do you know, did you not sleep well last night or probably not? But, do you yeah. know, like now I can go, look, I'm dyspraxic. <laughs> it just goes and I know how to control it. Yeah. And so yeah. if I have, yeah. you know, if I'm going out, then I know there's certain things I can do to support myself to be coordinated. Mm -hmm. or I can pre-warn people, go after two drinks, don't let me near those long-stemmed wine glasses. <laughs> I won't be able to focus anymore. <laughs> Alcohol yeah. definitely impairs, impairs your ability to be uh, oriented, sure that's does. for sure. Yeah, that sure does. I mean, we know that with people who aren't neurodivergent. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's more extreme. They often become neurodivergent, don't they, on, on our yeah. Um, and that that is the other thing too is like when we understand that um, all these environmental influences on our capacity to be oriented or to trigger a disorientation, it's it's just about being being smart about it. Like I had some some neighbors over for drinks the other week, and I was just cautious about how much I had to drink yeah. because I was serving people, welcoming people. You know, we had a lot, there was a lot going on. And my neurodivergent brain, my ADHD brain goes quite all over the place. Yeah, mine does too, especially. And so, I'm... you know, I said um, to my co-host, I said, just one, okay, just one gin. Until everyone's gone home, we're just having one gin. <laughs> and that was, a, that was sufficient to be comfortable without yeah. nervous that I would then make a mess and, because people then get anxious, you know, and you don't want that Absolutely. in a social setting. No, you don't. And so, Rachel, would you would would it be fair to say that Davis Art isn't just about learning to read at all? It 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 is more a holistic way of of um, perceiving the world. Yes. It, it adjusts your position, doesn't it? 
totally and and if we mm, take the case yeah, yeah we take the case that everything in life mm -hmm. is impacted by our perception so if we're not mm -hmm. accurately Absolutely. perceiving the world <laughs> yep then we're going to have potentially difficulty with you know walking Absolutely. correctly Good luck. Good luck. Um, driving safely yeah. um cycling safely cooking safely and 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 getting a result at the other end of that process um, through to reading, understanding what we're reading, spelling, writing, maths, um, all of all of those things, work, working with a computer. You know, one of the biggest sources of disorientation in my life is my computer because seemingly so many things don't, don't work the way that I expect them to work. Um, and it can get aggravating or frustrating. And so... I have oh, strategies. <laughs> yeah, I have strategies for not getting really frustrated. Like there's days where you just want to throw it out the window and that's probably not the answer. So it's developing yeah. an awareness of what is going to trip me up in this situation mm -hmm. and prepare pre prepaving, a friend of mine says, pre preparing myself for that situation. Yeah. Like the barking dog. Um <laughs> Thank you. you know, so that I so that I don't get um, too agitated, yes. um, and I can complete tasks. Yeah, 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 and and do things that previously I just would have walked away from. And and mm -hmm. I think a lot of learners. Some, that's that's back to that avoidance we talked about at the yes. top of the hour. Is um, we avoid things that seem difficult, mm -hmm. uh, or that we think that we can't do. Because often it'll throw us into that disoriented state. Well, it's stressful. And it's stressful. So yeah. we'll find workarounds. But yeah. my commitment is that people get enough skills to be able to work with their amazing brains in a productive way that they don't have to avoid those activities. Yes. So those as, activities as, that are stressful for them. Yeah. Yeah. And they can start enjoying them. So, you know, I enjoy shooting hoops now that I never. I'd never go near it. I didn't do it for, gosh, 40 years. Yeah. Now I enjoy doing it. You yeah. know, I enjoy cycling. Um, mm. I enjoy um, preparing a meal, whereas previously it used to be extremely stressful, mm. you know, because there's so many things could go wrong and you end up cutting <laughs> the wrong thing. happening at once and you can't. Oh, yes. Try, when, when you're, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I never really thought of myself as ADHD, but um, as I've as I've gotten older, I've realised, mm, yeah, there there are quite a few tendencies there for ADHD, particularly that that whole being unable to prioritise because everything has the same importance all at the same time. Yeah. Um, but when you using Davis techniques and um, there are other techniques it, it doesn't it's not that Davis has the ex exclusive um rights to to it but it is such a well put together program and and um yeah it, it, the results speak for themselves but through through focus really refocusing and and self-regulating you 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 end up being able to prioritize or I end up being mm. able to prioritize and and yes. I can do the things that that need to be done when they need to be done without that stress response of oh my god where do I start where do I start and never actually starting anything yes um, yeah um, yes and and choosing actually having a choice is is the big thing for me because when you're in that stress response you can't choose no you, you're, no. You're, it's because because you're, you're you're thrown into that fight flight absolutely mechanism that, yes that disorientated mm. that mm. visceral feeling of when you're disorientated so, yeah um it's and so I, yeah i think for the um the parents and tutors and teachers mm -hmm. who might watch this this live um, or a recording of it, it, it's important to sort of understand that when 
you know, a child is is sitting there and they're, they're like gripping the pen like this and it's not moving, they're in a stress response. Yes. They're probably just oriented and they're probably freaking out about producing something that is not going to be up to standard and they're going to be, it's going to reinforce some view or opinion they have of themselves is that they're mm. dumb or they're stupid or that they are failure. Or you know, they're I, not capable. They're just or they're not capable, good. yeah. Mm. Or like, I can't, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And um, I always take, when I work with young clients, I get them to do a little bit of a writing sample at the beginning of, of their program. And then as we go through the program and the follow -up, subsequent follow-ups, we'll do some more writing and I'll show them often their first one. And their first response is, I don't want to see how terrible <laughs> my writing was. Like, don't yeah. show me. It, it reminds me of how yeah. they're really embarrassed, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and Karamari would say they fuck a ma about it as well. Yeah. And so then when they can actually produce something that is legible and others can read it, suddenly their communication their ideas, their talent comes out of what's in their head mm -hmm. and onto paper. And they are thrilled to be able to share, even if it's a two sentence paragraph, but they've said something that has been inside and it's now oh, in writing. And, yeah. and, and in, in a way that people can understand. Well, people, yeah, people can engage with it. Yeah, it's not just the scrawl, it's, yeah. it's, um, you know, yeah. a, able to be um, yeah. enjoyed and shared, and um, you know, I really, it's some some I know that I had the neatest, most beautiful handwriting actually, but <laughs> what I wrote down didn't always come together and make sense, you know, um, because all these thoughts were coming into my head. And mm. I managed to get them down and it just came out all jumbled and upside yeah. down and inside out. And that's um I mean now I'm a I'm a prolific writer and I'm told <laughs> mm. I'm I'm a really good writer. Yes. Um even though I am dyslexic. Uh, my spelling still sucks, believe you me. Um thank goodness for spell check. <laughs> <laughs> and Google for that matter and Grammarly yeah. and things like that because, yeah. uh, you know, um, I love words but um, spelling is not my friend and I think what it is is, you know, when you think in pictures, a picture is worth a thousand words mm. and you try and translate what you can see in a picture into words. Yes. It's nigh impossible, really. It is yeah. it's almost an impossible task. Yeah, you, you, you could. If you ask somebody who wasn't neurodivergent mm. to describe the Mona Lisa to somebody who was blind, mm. they would never get no. any nuance. You cannot. No. You cannot yeah. do that. So when you're getting all this information in in, in a picture, and you're thinking, I think that didn't, isn't it that dyslexics think like a hundred times faster than a, a word thinker? A yeah, well, it, yeah. The best analogy, and I love where you're going with this, Kelly, because mm. this is this is why I'm a facilitator, is because yes. I want people's uh, thoughts, ideas, creations out of their head and into yes. the world. Into the world. Right? Exactly. And dyslexia can be an uh, unkind barrier to that happening, right? Yes. And so it's about taking away those barriers so that someone like yourself can say all these amazing things in the world and create all these amazing opportunities and resources yes. for people um, yeah. free of those sort of heavy yes. springs of, yes. of the dyslexic barriers, right? Yes. And, um, and I'm... I'm really reminded of um, an adult student I worked with um, early in my work as a facilitator, and he was a tutor, he's a print tutor, and he went into printing. Um, he knew he was dyslexic. He'd gone through a whole lot of other tr uh, 
programs for dyslexia, but none of them had really resolved his core issue, which was when he wanted to write something, he had to look up almost every word in the dictionary to get it right, every word. So mostly he wrote one sentence email, yeah. right? And we were lucky to get those from him. And um, he said, now I can say and I'm right the words in my head versus the simple words, which the only ones I could trust myself to spell right. And no, that, that was revolutionary. So he went from these like one sentence emails to 1500 words he sent me once. <laughs> I bet you wish you'd never told it. No, no, no. I was, I was just like, wow, we have unplugged the genie here. Yeah. And and he wrote the most beautiful, I mean, it was poetic what he wrote. He was writing yeah. about his students and reports on their progress, but mm -hmm. very, very insightful observations about them and their behaviours and their learning and everything. And and his passion for the industry and, and, and for their work yeah. just communicated. He'd never been able to do that before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and so um, that's what I really want for every client that I work with is, is yeah. that stopper in the bottle. Unleashing. Allows, yeah, unleashing yeah. all of that so, talent. Yeah, that, that kind of um, reminded me that Rachel about about the paper that I wrote, but um, which essentially discussed the the neurobiological um, epistemology or <laughs> causes of of neurodivergence, not just mm. dys dyslexia. Mm. And um, you know, with with all the research into brain, how the brain works and things, they've they come to a, a conclusion that most of these neurodivergent, in fact, all of the neurodivergent um, spectrums are due to a, a, a right brain dominance. Mm. And the right brain is associated with creativity, with pictures, yes. <laughs> with, 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 but what it is really What's really um, quite exciting about being able to unleash that, like you said, with that with that um, teacher and and him being very insightful and intuitive about his, mm. his that yes. is a very strong right brain function that yeah. um is has been I wouldn't say it is anymore, but it has been sorely lacking within. The world of education for for way too long, um, and if we can release the potential that is in that that right brain thinking, um, it, it, you know, it'll it'll change it'll change how we perceive education completely. Totally. Well, we need. Mm -hmm all types and all stripes of people in the world. And Absolutely. with the challenges we're facing in the world these days, getting bigger and more complex, we're mm -hmm. needing um, more creative, out-of-the-box thinkers, right, right brain thinkers, mm -hmm. people who are able to make connections from different... Uh, See the big from picture. Different, the big down. picture, the, the innovation. Um, you're not going to get that the results that we're looking for in the world, the solutions to these really what I often term as wicked problems, you know, and, and another piece of my life mm -hmm. I'm involved with um, development projects on the African continent and the creativity mm -hmm. and the thinking mm -hmm. outside the box needed there yeah. is not going to come from a, a purely analytical perspective. We, yeah. We're going to need the creativity. Mm -hmm. It's not, we need like, both. it's yeah. not like one's better than the other, but for yeah. a very long time it's been a left brain dominated world. And yeah. for whatever reason, I, I I have my theories. <laughs> I have my conspiracy theories. <laughs> but um, but that that's not the issue here. No. It, it's the, the issue is is that there is an obvious and desperate need for balance to be Yes. Um, restored. And, yeah. and 
And I think it is. I think it is. Um, like like through through programs like the Davis program. Yes. And yeah. other programs that recognize that we are human beings, we're not just brains <laughs> in education, you know. And yes. That in education is about creating fully connected, well, you know, communicative and creative human beings. Yes. That that will that will serve humanity and serve the earth um in a really productive and and, and exciting and creative way, you know? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, so I think that that is a very much a Davis a Davis principle actually. Because so Davis himself is very um spiritual for lack of a better he word. Is. So, he yeah. is. He's a very, very wise soul. And, you know, he spent his early years locked inside. He's both autistic and dyslexic, and he was really locked inside those mm -hmm. um, neurodiversities without any assistance to kind of unlocking his talent. Mm -hmm. And um, and it wasn't. And, and he discovered the power of making things. And so he, his backyard in California, had red clay, and anything he wanted, he made. And he eventually made the alphabet. And that's when he had his breakthrough and learned to read at the age of 20. So he made each letter out of clay and then was able to see it, perceive it accurately. And then he was able to teach himself to read and went on to become a mechanical engineer by training and an artist. And mm -hmm. that's when he discovered this whole phenomenon of, dis of disorientation because he was mm -hmm. hanging out with his artist mates and noticed that when he and they were at their artistic best, they, they were, were at their dyslexic mm -hmm. worst mm -hmm. and couldn't read and write well. And so he's like, hmm, why is that? And why is it not permanent? Why is it one day I'm, I can read quite well and the next day I can't? And so he started to unpack this whole world of disorientation and mm -hmm. then started working with people, with small groups of people, uh, until he could actually put together a program of learning that brought together that understanding about disorientation and how we can control it um, through our mm. own brain and our own perceptions, but also how to create those letters and then ultimately create the words out of clay or some clay-like substance so that the visual brain has a 3D representation of mm -hmm. it and it sticks. And so that's to come back to what I said right at the beginning is our beautiful language, English language, has 200, I think in 19 or 220 mm -hmm. words. They're the little words. We often sort of um, diminish them a bit by calling them the little joining words, but they're the words that bring the meaning in our language. Absolutely. But they're mostly non-picture words. So yeah. if you think about, if I say the word cat, most people will probably get a picture of a cat. Yeah. Um, if, you, if I say the word that. Yeah. Or, or the. Or yeah. the, or a, uh, or but, or he, or she, it's yeah. very hard to get a picture that represents the meaning of those words because they're non-picture words. And so part of what we do um, with the Davis methods is take those words those letters that we've created in clay and create the words but first we create a model that represents the meaning of that word so for a dyslexic uh, brain person the meaning is more important because that gives the picture is more important than the spelling yeah, yeah the picture exactly. the, the real meaning mm -hmm. so my the very first word i modeled was um with and I'll never forget the little model. It was two little um, people holding hands because it's the idea that you do something with another, right? Yeah. And so that's, that has stayed that's with me for the last yeah. years, you know. Yeah. And once it's made, once it's created, that's the other thing, you're putting your energy, your creative energy into each of those models. Once you've mm. made them, they're with you for life. It's very hard to erase those out. 
Yes. And so when you're reading, it's not like you're um, getting explicitly those pictures, but it is feeding that movie. And as you said, mm -hmm. um, for a dyslexic brain, it, it, it works like a movie. So if you compare the difference between watching the movie of a book, might mm -hmm. get you two hours and you get the whole thing and it's in full pictures and 3D and the sound, you got the yeah. very yeah. much the whole thing. Yeah. And reading that same book, might take you, I don't know, if you're a really good reader, maybe a weekend, but usually yeah. a week or more or more. That's yes. the difference. So as a picture thinker, it's that fast. Yes. Whereas as a word thinker, it takes longer. Yes. So we Absolutely. we might talk, you know, like somewhere around 300 or something words, depends how fast you talk like me. But yeah. um, <laughs> you're still not giving everyone that big, rich, creative picture exactly that a neurodiverse that. person will be getting yes absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. and it's not only those little words those joining words those 270 words if you think about it it's also things like conceptual words you know yes um like my favorite word absolutely I mean, yes no picture for that no so um you know the, yep. that that also causes disorientation in some yes. in, in dyslexic reader. Yeah, um, and when and when you think about it, those two hundred and twenty words hmm. make up about sixty percent of our everyday language. So if you remove them from a passage of text, hmm. what is someone left with? They're left with picture words and action words. Exactly, and that's it. So yeah. instead of, of, of like the sentence, you know, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, you'll get fox, brown, or brown. Yeah. So brown fox jumps over, you might get that as a picture, dog. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that does not give you the nuances of quick or, or lazy, or you know. Like that, exactly. Yeah, you're not getting exactly. the whole thing, and that that was probably not the best sentence to to give you. But there's a lot of sentences <laughs> that you take out those those non picture words, and there was zero sense to be made of it. And that's Absolutely. what our just our particularly our highly dyslexic learners are trying to navigate. And so when someone says, "Read that and tell me what it means," and then you get that is true for them, they yeah. do not get what was on that page. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I relate to that. Phonics made no sense to me mm. whatsoever until I was an adult. Yes. Um, because, because it didn't address that, that gap of, of the meaning of those words. And, and your phonemic awareness centre is in the, on the left side of your brain. And yes. essentially dyslexics are using the right side of their yeah. brain for a left brain function. Yes. So it completely misses out that phonemic awareness place yes. in the brain. Yeah. So biologically dyslexic people, you know, and and I was definitely one of those, can't learn through phonics. Mm. So um, we do eventually, <laughs> but much later in life yes. than anybody else. Does you know in and physical it, reader, and it can be really frustrating too if if you've had some phonics instruction and like this um adult student I had all of his dyslexia instruction class after class every Saturday was on in the phonics method yes. and he wasn't he didn't see much improvement and then he of course he got punished as if he was not working hard problem. right yeah. Yeah. there's a really sad correlation between punishment and neurodiversity which is mm -hmm. you know a whole other master's topic right there but yeah. um you know it's it's not for want of trying for most of of our learners it's that the perhaps and this is what I want to probably leave people with perhaps the method that's been used is not the right method for that particular learner okay. it's a bit like right. trying to run you know a Macintosh with PC Operating system. Operating system. It, it goes badly. It goes really badly <laughs> for <the> Macintosh. <laughs> it does. And, and the think, user. <laughs> I think it, before we before we conclude, I think it's really important to bring up the fact that 
you know, structured literacy and phonics, we're not advocating that it is not taught in schools. It, no. Obviously, it, it, the research shows that that is um, the neurotypical way kids learn mm. read because reading is actually a very, very recent function. Yes. And we haven't evolved into, we haven't evolved a reading brain, so to speak. Um, well, it's, I think we're still evolving it. Still evolving it. Yeah. Um, and it is a very left brain function. So obviously we want, we need that structured literacy start for reading. Yes. And, and for for the majority, and I'll do that in, um, mm. <laughs> for most kids, let's say. But, and also if you have that and it's not going well for a student, then it's, it, that's, uh, a, an easy diagnosis or a or an indication that that student may be neurodivergent. Yes. Um, uh, and then then other strategies. Yes. Them, and if if those strategies don't work for them in the classroom, and I'm talking about the response to intervention mm. model here, you know, um, if those strategies that you implement in the classroom for those particular kids doesn't work then you know that it's a third tier problem and yep. you need to get hold of a facilitator or yep. a, 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 you know somebody outside of the classroom yes yeah, a, a, a specialist um who, who can look look to and diagnose what what's at the root cause of it you know absolutely what we haven't absolutely. talked about today and that could be a topic for another day is yeah, you know, there's a lot of physical things that are going on for children as well, and it's good to mm -hmm. eliminate those. You know, like hearing issues or sight issues. Yeah, you know, I started failing at math. Always... Yeah, at at the yeah. age of twelve because my vision diminished, and I was sitting in the back of the class, and they had to move me to the front yeah. and get I wear glasses to distinguish, yeah. you know, numbers on the on the board. So. Yeah. Yeah. We have to look at all of those factors as well um, in a holistic way with, with students. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Well, Rachel, it's been absolutely fantastic working with you again and talking with you. And um, um, we, you'll definitely be coming back soon and we'll dive into some um, more specific topics like ADHD, yes. um, even dyspraxia, and perhaps talk about um, some of the things that people can um, dive into to get help when they need it. Um, yeah, I'd really love to do a session on like strategies to support um, to support parents who've got children with uh, with ADHD, and yeah. what are some practical things? Um, you know, before even engaging them. a professional, what what are practical things that you can do at home or in the classroom to make life a little bit easier for your person with ADHD and for yourself because they tend to have life. that uh, spread yeah, out there. Everyone, not just exactly. The, uh, yeah, yes, it, it's definitely so, has a, a wide effect. Yeah, yeah. So if you're watching this live, tune in again, keep your eye open on the ARC Education NZ. Um, and actually it's the ARC Education because we're not just New Zealand based anymore. We've gone global. Very yes, quickly. yay. <laughs> yeah. And um, if you need to get hold of Rachel, um, if you're going, hmm, I've got a I've got a child, or I myself um would like to look into the, the Davis Facilitation Program, um, please have a look on the ARC Education um, directory under specialists and learning support and Rachel's contact details are there or have a look for her Facebook page and um, her, um, her website um, <laughs> at Master Dyslexia. Is it .com or is it .co.nz? .co.nz. Yeah, so it's www.masterdyslexia.co.nz. 
That's right. Thank you so much, Rachel. Rachel, oh, <laughs> I'm getting tired. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Callie. It's been such a great conversation. I, we went places I wasn't even expecting, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I hope it's um, been of interest to people and look forward to having another chat soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay.